And uh, to follow the, the trend of a moment in time and global trends, we will be talking about cross-border investing uh, with some really exciting people on the panel. I'm super thrilled for this. And to kick this off, I'm excited to invite the moderator for this session, Jan Amri, to the stage. Thank you. Hello. Glad to be here today. Good to see you. And then I would like to invite the panelists on stage. Uh, Catherine Xiang, welcome, and Paul Bragiel, welcome. Unfortunately, Chris Running had a personal uh, family emergency and he couldn't join us today, but hopefully he'll be back next year at least. Please uh, have a seat and then let's have a little chat. And hopefully we try to keep things interactive here, so don't be shy to, you know, raise your hands if you have comments and let's see towards the end if we have time for audience questions. So, exciting topic here today and uh, distinguished panelists. And of course the whole idea is to, you know, discuss a little bit of different continents, countries, where things, money moving, these kind of things here. And uh, hopefully we have some horror stories too here so that we don't, we don't uh, do the same mistakes or avoid perhaps some things in our, our future. So, uh, Okay, let's start briefly, if you could introduce yourself and uh, tell a little bit about your current main investment activities and maybe list a couple of countries or continents where you have had past experiences on the investment side. So uh, perhaps, Catherine, you can go first. Okay. We're a single family office. We're in our eighth generation. We actually behave like an institution. Our minimum check size is $70 million. I personally angel. Um, so I've been in the tech world for, golly, since the late 90s. So I worked for jobs when I was in high school. I was the general counsel for a small company called Intuit, QuickBooks. And one of uh, my small claims to fame is I did home banking, which means that today you move money off your phone, off your laptop, and two, it was the first tech company that did that, was able to do that without a new banking law or anything like that. So I built my own startup. I raised $4.8 million in less than 45 days, and this is the first tech boom. It took me almost two years to raise my Series A at $20 million. So I've gone through the pain of begging, and now on the family side, I'm also very accustomed to looking at both direct investment opportunities as well as through funds globally. Thank you. Hey everybody, my name is Paul Bregill, um, former entrepreneur, built three companies in Silicon Valley and kind of gaming and social media in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, turned into an investor in 2010 after I exited my last company. Uh, started a fund called Bregill Brothers with me and my brother. Uh, so it's kind of pseudo fund, pseudo family office. And then, yeah, over the last decade, we've also been launching funds around the world. Uh, we, have over, we have seven funds on six continents. Uh, I've done over 400 investments in 40 different countries. Um, and then also do LP checks as well on the side. But yeah, we're very generalists. Um, but yeah, we just enjoy backing early, amazing entrepreneurs in their kind of seed series A level. And oh, Paul, you're being so modest. Why don't yeah. you talk about kayaking down the Mississippi <laughs> or bike riding across the U.S., which is actually what he did. Let's see, we'll have some... Uh... Thank you for that. Um, I don't know how relevant that is today. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, I also have a sense of adventure, and I make fun of myself a lot. And um, I really believe in supporting not only entrepreneurs, I'm a big fan of supporting musicians, artists, designers, athletes. I think these are all people that are like going for the one in a million dream. And if I could be part of those people's lives... I like to do that, and also sometimes I partake in those silly adventures myself too. And thank you for Super. laying and it up for me nicely. Six continents, that's more than I know perhaps, but uh, there's a new continent. Yeah, yeah. But uh, okay, let's get back. Catherine, you mentioned you are single family office and even globally, both directly and through the funds. So what are the main differences versus, you know, normal GP yeah. do, doing investing, you know? Uh, how does it differ? Yeah. Thanks, thanks for, uh, for highlighting that. Um, as a family office, we don't have an investment horizon, obviously, and we also don't have a pressure. I'm, I know that you guys, um, through Golden Gate, have a lot of family offices as well involved. Um, unlike a multifamily, single family, it's all our capital. 
And I was on a panel in New Orleans only four days ago with another family office, and he said something, he, Simon Jung's family, he said something very relevant, which is, it's our cash. We have it in the bank. We don't have to wait to pool money together, and we also don't have to work within a mandate and a framework. But that doesn't mean we don't have a portfolio construction or a risk-adjusted return horizon lookout, mm. but we do have patience. So we don't have FOMO, fear of missing out at all. But at the end of the day, somebody asks, what do you look for in a GP or in, a, in an entrepreneur people? And I think the last session, somebody said that. We invest in you. We invest in people. I mean, I agree. I, you know, a lot of us GPs are envious of that, right? So we have our 10-year you know, plus <laughs> one plus one. Or sometimes you're lucky, you could push through like a 15-year fund. But yeah, some deals, you know, they take a long time. And they take 20, 30 years before they really hit their stride. Right? I want to so, ask you something about yeah. that, which is Sequoia. What do you think of what Sequoia did? Re registered as an RIA with a family fund, right? Yeah. And that you have to pay to play to go down into the baby funds, which, like you, yeah. are more generalistic and specific. And obviously got a little bit too excited and got caught with Sam Bankman. I mean, yeah, I mean, like... They're, they are able to do that, right? So, I mean, yeah, of course, they, you know, everyone has their failures and bad deals. And no, no, but Rob, what do you think of the RIA so, you know, situation? I was, I was just going to yeah, get to that. Yeah. But like, I think that's exciting, right? I mean, like, they've earned that right, right? They've been around for quite a long time. They have amazing returns. We're all envious of that. We always want to say that. So, like, I think what they've done is, like, they've been able to capture the value. I don't know how great it is for some of the family offices, some of their investors, but for them as owners, I think it's a great opportunity for them. So well, it depends on what angle you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, let me, let me kind of go with this because we're on the cross-border theme. What yep. Sequoia did is that they registered themselves under the U.S. Securities 1940 Act as a registered investment advisor to bypass the venture capital exemption. So VCs right now are under the 40 Act, but they're limited to only invest in what they say they're going to. They can't dibble-dabble. And what Sequoia mm. did by registering as a 40 Act, they get to invest in everything because now they're an advisor, but they have to, the rub is they have to disclose. But another thing about what Sequoia did is they only did that for Europe and US. Sequoia China, is not under disclosure. And so mm. when, as a LP, as a family office, we look not just for, forget about fees. Everybody jumps around fees. We are happy to keep your lights on. We are happy to give you your carry. But we don't want you to play around with our capital. And I think that a lot of people did not re-up on Sequoia because of the ability that they can dibble-dabble globally. Now, I kind of want to go back to investing globally. Because yeah. I know, Jan, you've got a whole bunch of questions on why we we're would go into certain... We're flexible here. We'll go with the we're, flow. We're free flow here. We're, we're good. I think Jan's cool with us saying it out. Don't okay. worry about it. Okay. <laughs> is, is what is really interesting is the fact that we will go in funds that we have very little experience in that risk. And we appreciate Paul and Vinny and his team's experience, for example, in certain sectors, in certain markets. Mm in certain types of tech or even in PE. But in direct, we will go direct on, on, I'll give you an example. We did a direct deal with Burger King, and this was five years ago in 19 sub-Saharan countries. We have experience because we also tag along with another family. 85 families we've worked with globally for decades, and we are little bitches. We gossip. You piss off one of us. You know it. You know oh, it. Oh, I know. Everyone's talking shit behind our back. That's yeah. We talk shit about you, too. Everyone's talking shit about everybody, right? So, yeah. but, and, okay. and the thing is, we... <laughs> I see you. So, so what's really cool about mm. this is the fact that on an LP basis, we often are on the same team. Yeah. On direct, mm. we rely on our GPs to feed us. Now, on globally, so for example... You've done a deal in Brazil. I've done deals with in Brazil. You've done, you're now opening an office in Vietnam. We, we've been in Vietnam with Dragon Capital for decades. So what is interesting is why would we, and we love the Nordics, or I love the Nordics, and I was at 001 conference about, what, a month ago, and I got so excited by the new managers coming out of the Nordics. Valuations are completely different and they're low-hanging fruit. doesn't mean that the U.S. market, European market, in, in, in a broader sense, is not good. It just means there's opportunity here. 
and that's why I'm here. And I've met some phenomenal people in terms of direct. I'm also open for fund managers, because that means I get a much broad, broader cross-fertilization. Yeah. But the tax here sucks. You guys, Finland, have capital gains tax between 30 and 34 percent. Whoa, unless you guys do a feeder fund, whoa, right? This is why I avoided it. So I have a fund here in Finland. Uh, the first two funds we did in Finland, and you know, third fund, we're like, we're out of here. Yeah. We still have a Finnish team, but we did it all in the United States because it made no mm -hmm. sense, right? It's like, and I, I would have loved to have kept the money here. And yeah, the, the government wanted to give us money, but I was like, guys, the money doesn't make sense. My LPs are not happy. I'm not happy. Yeah. I, as a U.S. resident, also get taxed multiple times. I was like, I'm out of here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I still wanted to tap into Finnish town. I'm still very happy to put into companies here in the whole region. Also, I'm a big mm. fan of Eastern Europe as well, too. Yeah. It's, you know, kind of tracking behind the Nordics. But yeah, it's like, I agree with you, the tax structure yeah, is messed up. Switzerland, zero capital gains. And I'm surprised why there's not more tech or, or funds over there. Go ahead. Ah, uh, yes. Well, the, the problem there, with that, yeah, yeah. Question, no, I was going to come a little bit later, yeah. but we can skip and go straight to that, yeah. So where do you see the movement? Is there new, what's the hotspots for setting up a fund? Have you seen some movements in the recent year? What could be a new hotspot or, and then is there per specific reasons why this is happening? I mean, I could tell from my perspective, right? So um, I've seen, I mean, we've done, we've done funds in Singapore, uh, Netherlands, Mauritius, United States, uh, and we experimented with Luxembourg, we ended up passing on that. Um, and yeah, in the end, now we've moved almost everything, and also we then came in, we moved everything into the United States. It was just really easy, super simple. People understood what was going on. Um, and yeah, like all of our LPs, and we have LPs from, I can't even count how many countries, we're very comfortable with that. Um, so we did that. Um, so I think US has gotten even more relevant in terms of like fund structure. And then, yeah, the Caymans and these guys are still quite popular, but, you know, some of them, you know, appear on gray lists sometimes. Some of them are getting more complicated. You know, and some of them are actually nightmares. You asked me, like, you know, some, you talked a little bit, you know, like, we did a fund in Mauritius for my Africa fund, which is a very common setup, but that is a slog, right? And the amount of, like, they had appeared on a gray list. And it, they were totally clean. We're in a gray for two years, appeared clean again. But it was a pain in the ass to us, right? So our next fund we're discussing, we're like, do we want to do that again? Do I want to... But that crap, I mean, I don't know, right? So, you know, yeah. I have a, you know, I think that Europe, EU has done two good things and to move away from uh, uh, AI FMD compliance. So, if, if you're a new manager or even an existing manager, you can go through the exemption of five, if you have 500 million AUM, less than 500 ma million. You don't have to go through all that compliance for fundraising and compliance. You go through the EU VC funds and EU social entrepreneurship fund which is why we look at when we're working with our managers, we try to structure as much as we can, especially you know, helping uh, in, in terms of our own self-centered and self-interest in terms of structuring our tax value in there. So we do look at GPs that have the wherewithal to get the exemption if they're under 500 million AUM, and if they're over 500 million AUM, look for feeder funds, and that's very popular. That's a borrow from hedge, where they um, structured, and that's an American hedge strategy that is actually very popular. But again, the regulatory, it's a myriad compliance in terms for GPs and for fundraising and for LPs. Not only the tax country by country, layered with the EU compliance. It, it makes us a little shell-shocked going to what Paul is saying about investing in these markets with, G, for, with GPs. We really got to like that because by the time we get all the haircuts, fees, hurdle, carry, tax, compliance, time, follow on, it's, 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 it, it, it's a hurdle versus a typical, uh, you know, going into sub-Saharan Africa or something or America. You know, it's a no-brainer. Please. 
under the, the new compliance? Uh, microphone. Can we have one handheld microphone here, please, for the audience? Bernari, please. It will be. It's coming here. Yes, yes. It's good I love idea. the interactivity, you, don't you? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do. <laughs> no, no worries. I was just trying to, this will be very brief, just trying to be, put a little bit of nuance on, on the image that is created. Uh, we're GP, we have international funds, we have a Delaware Cayman structure. We decided to establish the new fund in the Netherlands. It's been tax reviewed. Obviously, it's a cooperative. There's a legal uh, structure also that you be, need to be mindful of. And it's fine. It's what do you mean fine. it's fine from your perspective or the no LPs' tax perspective? Leakage. It's uh, seen by the, G by the LPs as similar uh, efficient as the existing structure that we have. So and just to put a little bit of nuance on, on what you are all LPs saying. LPs or is it all uh, Dutch LPs? Or? No, no, it's uh, very international. Very, okay. Asia, US, uh, Europe. And the other point I wanted to make just quickly, again, to put a little bit of nuance here, is that it depends on what kind of LPs you like to attract. Because mm. uh, some folks would actually uh, perhaps like to move away from Cayman and Delaware, first point. Second point, Article 9 under EU regulation is appreciated by some LPs because they know you will be transparent about your reporting on, on certain issues. It's coming more... Of so, course. I mean, it's so like my European Union fund... Uh, focusing on Eastern Europe is called Smog Ventures. We incorporate the Netherlands because we have EIF money coming in, right? So we're like, okay. And you have Polish money. They, want, they were cool with that. They didn't want to go to the United States. Yeah, so some people don't want to go to the United States. That's fair enough, too. But most of my employees were more than happy to actually. They wanted to diversify away from right. Asia and Europe. So, yeah, it does, it does depend on your LP structure. Some might say this is a no-go. A lot of Swiss family offices don't want to go to the United States for that's fine, right? You also could do feeder funds. This way, the key thing is, like, right. you have to find a place that works for you and your LPs to have a conversation with them. And if they say it's a no-go, well, how big of a check is it? <laughs> ah, you're not big enough, so I'm sorry, I don't care. <laughs> oh, you're really big. Mm, okay, I have to rethink this strategy, right? So it's so open true. conversation. Mm. So yeah, true. There's certain jurisdictions that just gotten really annoying. And yeah, certain jurisdictions just make no sense. And unfortunately, as you were pointing out, Finland doesn't make any sense to start a fund here. For, for 30%, yeah. Percent, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, with no disrespect. We love the country. We love the country. I know. Like, I just, it's, that. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it, you have to really love the GP here that's domiciled here. And you can be a, a Finnish fund, but not domiciled yeah. here. That's, that's because that's where the tax is. Now, speaking about, so, in Viet, so a lot of countries like in uh, Vietnam right now and Thailand are, have followed, um, and Nigeria have followed the U.S. model of global taxation. So you can't get away with that. Wherever, so if you're domiciled in those jurisdictions, just as an example, you're going to be taxed as an LP in there and, or withholding. So why are we harping about tax? It's because by the time you get your, all your haircuts, that's your return. And that's, that's something that we do try to, that's a low-hanging fruit to try to wipe off the slate to get to a higher IRR. And our GPs appreciate that, as, and, and we're very flexible. I do want to touch on something that Jan was going to ask and you just brought up, which is investor construction. I think that Paul has a lot of insight here. I'm going to let him go first, and then I'm going to cover that next on how your GPs, funds, even family offices, or because you, you're you know, investing with your brother, how you mm. look at investors, how you look at LPs, participants in your family. Mm. I mean, yes. it depends, right? So for me, like, yeah, the way I look at LPs is like, yeah, one, I want to work with people I have relationships with. I mean, just like LPs want to have something, we, we do too, right? It's a long-term thing, right? Uh, two, people that are can be flexible with some of Some of my funds are very, very general, right? You have to just trust me. If you don't, then I don't want to work with you. It's a filter, right? Some of the funds are very specific. We have a fund that focuses only on video games and these verticals, and people know what they're buying into, right? So, yeah, you have to find the people that make sense with what you're building. Now, obviously, that's, you know, pretty obvious. But, like, but some LPs also are going to push back and ask for certain things, and you have to be willing to say no. And if you could say no, then, then you really kind of go out there and build the fund that's your dream fund and people are going to be collaborating with. And you'll kind of also get to, you know, build relationships with people and they'll be in your second, third, fourth, fifth fund or whatever, right? So, um, yeah, it's never easy, right? Sometimes you're getting desperate. Right now, last couple of months, last year, some people are hitting walls, right? And you're like, oh, do I take that money? And sometimes you might have to, right? But um, hopefully you're in a position where you don't have to. Right? It's an ideal situation. Yeah. Um, from a family office, we, real, as we invest in the manager, 
we get to know them. And I'll give you a small story, which is old, so I can disclose it. So we were investors in Bering Private Equity, John, John Salata's fund, and they, they blew it out of the water. First fund, whoa, second fund died, and they couldn't raise their third fund, and we were there. We stayed with them, AIG anchored it, and the third fund blew it out of water. So as a family office, I want to toot our, toot our collective group's horn, is that once we like you, we like you. You know, we all, you know, we all have bad days, if you will. And mm. capital is something else that we look at. We push it out. So I was at a conference in New Orleans as I was um, last week, and there's a multifamily. He says, whoa, we're sitting on a pile of cash. And I'm going, what the hell? Why would you ever do that? Or an earlier person, and I was snickering, said, yes, 5% interest rate. And I'm going, really? You're, you're really getting all junked up about 5% interest rate, inflation, tax, I mean, really, dude? When you have cash, you want to push it out, at least for us. And as a family office, we look at working with our GP, and if we, ha we have operating companies, and if it falls in our sector, we'll, we'll, we'll network with you, we'll help you to the extent when we can. In tech, we go out of our way. So we spent a lot of money in R&D in one of the operating companies um, in for, clean, uh, for its packaging. So looking at um, opportunities to, for climate change. And if those, that tech fits into something you're doing, absolutely, our, you know, mi casa, su casa. Our house, your house, go for it. And we, we love our managers that way. Um, from a portfolio construction, if I were a GP looking at LPs, be like an entrepreneur. Look for smart money because you don't want somebody every month, hey, where the hell is my money? Give me my report and the LPGP dynamics, right? The transparency or lack of it thereof. I'll give you another story. Um, big Silicon Valley fund started a Brazil VC, okay? And yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and the, um, so I was talking, they were showing me their highlight of their portfolio company that they were like proud of. One of them was uh, HR platform, um, and they claimed Disney was a major client for them in Spain. One of my buddies runs HR in Disney, texting real time. Hey, you know this company? Oh yeah, we're about to kill them in Spain. We're gonna, no, no, that company, no, get out, get out. And that was one of their strong portfolio. So like I said, we're little bitches. We gossip and we know a lot of people. Real time, you know? Beware. <laughs> and, and I want to also ask, because you mentioned this, you know, different types of uh, emerging managers there, and then you do direct, indirect. So how do you kind of like evaluate and decide on this region or this industry or topic? Where do you decide where you go direct? And where do you find a good manager to work for you? And Paul has a lot of experience because he angels as well. So I'm going to let him go first, whether he throws it to one of his uh, funds or whether he you know, throws it to his family office or uh, angels this. I mean, for me, it's pretty strict, actually. So, like, if it falls into, like, one of the regions that one, I first will give first pass to my fund. So let's say it's a deal that's coming in that's in Brazil. Okay, the Brazil fund sees it first, right? If they pass on it, then and I'm in love with it, then I'll make sure, and I'll actually, in this close sale piece, I'm going to still put money in person, right? So I, I want to make sure that, you know, my partners, my LPs eat first. If they don't like it, then I will jump in, right? Also, if it's something that I'm, like, you know, sometimes I will have done, like, a deal in one region, but it's actually cross-region, right? It actually makes sense. Um, if I'm in a deal in one fund already, and the second fund wants to come in a little bit later, the next round, I will then, like, you know, remove myself from the decision-making process, and let my partners do it. So, like, and I, I want to make sure that all my LPs are saying, like, hey, Paul, I come with a lot of, how would you say, conflicts. I am a walking conflict of interest, but I try to, like, <laughs> mitigate as much as possible mm. and make sure that people know that I have partners and, you know, people around me. So, like, I know I'm not doing these things by myself. I'm doing it with other people involved, and they're all signed off on it. So, um, yeah, I try to be as transparent as possible, make sure that everyone knows and disclose if I am going to do something like that. No. Might not. Well, that sounds wonderful because I've heard stories that some have not shared it to the LPs. They put their personal money before the, even the fund, but very rare stories like that. But how, how about Katrina? Yeah, how do you we're see a little it? disparate in that way because the family's minimum check size has grown to $70 million. And the reason why is because either you grow team size and you know the overhead problem or you write bigger checks. 
I mean, our poor analyst is running, what, you know, 75 to 80 companies, opportunities. And um, as some of our older manager professional sunsets, we're not going to replace them. And that is a way to manage our overhead and to increase our performance. So that is why the checks have gone bigger. Now, I angel up to 100,000. So there's a big Big difference, huge difference. I personally like to angel, especially in uh, sectors in uh, deep learning, orbital waste, orbital tech. Um, these are near and akin to me, quantum, and quantum not in the buzzword, and AI's been around since, you know, uh, Alan Turing. But all of a sudden, it's big. When AI is, as you know, all about vectors and just vectors and data, and we've been in data for a long time, so I like to angel that, and so what the family does is that it picks up after me. They have a f right of first refusal, so I, I don't have LPs, I have a family, so therefore, I eat, I'll invest in something, my, I have money at risk, and then over time, they get a f right of first refusal in Series B. So for example, Impossible, they gave us an opportunity to invest in Series E. We turned it down, but I gave them the idea to go to Asia, and that's where they made bank for Series E, and that's also, they said, oh, Asians don't eat burgers, and I was like, what the hell are you talking about? Asians don't eat beef? <laughs> anyway, so obviously, have you heard of Kobe? You know, so they, um, they migrated to Asia instead of Europe, and you know, the rest is history. I will do um, projects um, from a direct investment out of my own selfish interest of that se sector. The family, on the other hand, is portfolio construction. We're not going to double down on a risk. So co-investment isn't as interesting to us as some for some families, because we're doubling down on that risk. Mm -hmm. We'd rather just come back on the next round. And we don't mind fees again, because you guys earn it. That's refreshing. Because <laughs> a lot of people hate fees, right? They really kind of, a lot of people also use it as an excuse. Oh, yeah, we don't like your fun because of the fees. You're like. Okay, well, you, maybe you just don't like them. Honestly. Get yeah, over it. Yeah, because fun of funds, on the other hand, and I'll tell you another little gossip. I told you I'm a gossip. You know, the Pandora family, they sold out, so they, 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 they don't have operating capital yet anymore. And they hired a um, professional that only does fund of fund when they wanted to do direct deals. Now, three years later, guess what they're doing? Fund of funds, and they're out of capital because they don't have new capital coming in, so they're in a multifamily now. So the, the, the thing about it, it's all about portfolio construction, whether we do, and risk allocation, whether we're going to do a direct, and our own comfort in that sector, our own flavor. And again, at the end of the day, it's the managers. And uh, when you think of different types of managers and doing, you know, financial diligence, due diligence, how do you see the difference there when you're evaluating the, or making the decisions? As an LP for first. No, I'm asking Catherine first. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Our LDD and FDD for GPs are different, whether it's a single manager, whether it is a um, mature fund, and if, or if it's an emerging. We give a lot of breaks, but the key thing that we really look at is the back office. Because once we throw in the capital, it's the back office that's going to really give us the transparency. Now, when I said we don't like co-investments, when it comes to um, emerging managers, we will do that because it gives us transparency into the GP, how they're thinking, what they're doing, how their due diligence. We're almost like in bed with them at that time. With a mature manager, we don't invest in funds over a billion dollars. We're just lost in the shuffle. We get a report. It's, you know, it's almost like the 5% investment. You know? um, we get our regular. Um, the fees are there, but there's, it's nothing insightful. It's like Treasury, which is great right now, but U.S. Treasury, but since they cut the deal, <laughs> I think they, they cut the deal. Um, so so my, my point here is at the end of the day, we look at the back office and we also like to follow. I think somebody was from Cambridge earlier. What we like about Cambridge reports is the fact that there is no conflict of interest. They can't invest. They only write research reports. I don't know what the other guy was saying about re, you know, investing, but Cambridge is, is strong. So we take a lot of research and we spend a lot of time when it's a more when it's an um, emerging manager, but we babysit incredible amount. 
It's almost like investing in an entrepreneur. We like solo managers because they've got that huge entrepreneurial spirit. We also, for example, I mean, people look at diversity and ESG and all this other crap. No, at the end of the day, we're agnostic. We look at the talent, the person, trust, relationship. And just like, you know, your LPs stay with you guys forever. Very interesting. Any, any, any thoughts from the audience or questions coming up? If not, start thinking, rare occasion, you can get what... Uh, what? Here for Catherine. Um, you said that you like solo GPs, uh, which is actually a pretty interesting thought. Some LPs actually don't like solo GPs, and it's a bit of an argument in that, you know, key man theory, there's only one person. How do you think about that, and how do you mitigate the risk um, in working with solo GPs? We've been, um, we have invested in several solo GPs in the past three years because of their expertise in a market um, that we don't have access. And they're usually, I hate to sound like this, but related to an important family. And so they have not only access to deal flow, and I think somebody in an earlier panel said, you know, getting into one of the funds in Silicon Valley is like, you got to get your knee pads out, right? Unless you're part of the bro world, you're not going to get in a deal. And that's why I emphasize that I came from tech. I came from the tech world so that I can get into there. And so it's usually a, a somebody from a, a family. Um, I'll give you an example here is uh, Indonesia. Every country is essential, whether you like it or not, is owned by yeah. so many families. Especially, I mean, five to seven. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Brazil. Yeah, Brazil for sure. Right? So at the end of that, in Vietnam, I mean, I can go down the list. And, and so we, we will invest in an you know, offshoot. Um, in China, for example, we invested in four tycoons' kids. Um, and only one manager out of that, but the capital came from these tycoon kids, each dumped $100 million into the fund, but one manager. So it's usually kind of, it's not so much as, I have a dream, I have a hope, and you know, we'll, we'll roll out. It's usually because they can get us deal flow that we can't otherwise access. Two, they've got a huge network to support them in execution to get to their point. Yeah, Thanks for, that's a great question, yeah, yeah. Carl. Always, it's a huge risk, I mean, but I've heard that you know, what happens if the soul or something happens to the person, you know, or like that, and then what happens then? I guess that's the risk management then. Um, right? You know, at the end of the day, if um, solo GPs usually do have, as I said, you, they use Carva, you know, a back office. It's not like, oh, it's not like an entrepreneur, you know, and he's building something, a widget, and then he drops dead. I hate to sound like that. It's, yeah, there's usually staff and infrastructure yeah. around them. You have to, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like... It, you could say almost like me and my brother in the United States. I mean, it's almost like a sole GP. It's one family, right? And, yeah, like, it's a, it's a risk and built into that. But, yeah, we have a lot of structure around us. We have, you know, all the proper accounting, all this stuff. So, yeah, if something were to happen, me and him were on a plane, we fell off the planet, things would not fall off the planet. So. I mean, I'm just looking at Golden Gate, which is where I knew you guys from when I met you at a Formula One. Thank you for that invitation. It was great. I think I was drunk. I don't remember anything after that. Yeah. It was really a lot of fun in remember. Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> All my events are like that. <laughs> That's why we're partnered with y'all. We love this. <laughs> um, it, it, it is the fact that if you look at, you know, just using him as an example, if you look, there's usually not only the infrastructure, but there's usually talent in the region they're trying to go after. So I'll look at a GP, and I'll look at what they're trying to execute. Do they have, and you're, you're bringing up another great question, which is the milieu. So for example, the ecosystem. I am not sure, other than the tax, Finland has a great infrastructure. What, you guys have over 300 and something universities, public universities, I think. You have, Finland has, and, and Nordics are incredibly highly talented, um, educated class, uh, social infrastructure, medical, free medical. I mean, it takes a lot of burden off of the GP in terms of, um, or the entrepreneurs. The, so we look at, that's why it's exciting. If you look at a certain market, say, you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Congo, it doesn't have that same talent, yeah, right? Remember those taxes, remember those taxes. Right, that's, well, you yeah, asked. They go somewhere. Right, well, you they asked. Go somewhere, right. You know. right, well, you asked why, what you could do. I think in your notes is what can these countries do to encourage more LP and more investments? I mm. think that the, well, you know, 
50% is your income tax, but 30, 34% for capital gains. There's no such thing as capital gains, actually. It just is a tax. And then the mm. withholding. So I think that maybe a uh, special economic zone, some type of attraction, maybe another underwriting, because you guys have a Series B crunch problem, too. Everybody knows that. So yeah, I think you, the regulators... For Europe, it's getting slow on the B runs for sure. So I don't know how it's in other locations mm -hmm. in the Canada world. Canada has that. World mostly is. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Canada mm. has a hard time attracting um, LPs and um, investors for entrepreneurs for Series B as well because of the tax infrastructure. So they get A's but no B's. Um, I think that's because B's, you know, you guys as GPs and our direct in um, investors, you look at a company. You've got to have not only now, not a hope and a dream, but you've got to have real revenue. And you've got to have exact, a, a defined market. And you have to have growth. And that is harder for bees, to raise the bee. For sure. Like, so, so you referred to dream. What would be as, as an LP or as a fund manager? So what would be the kind of like the dream scenario? If you had a magic wand then you can make a perfect <laughs> from your perspective, what, what, what would you kind of like a do? Remembering that we still need to keep up the, you know, the living standards. I mean, the thing is, it's just more it's like foreign money coming in, just have it pass through, right? I mean, we're still be investing in companies in the country. Those still get taxed. People who make salaries still get taxed. It's like, just don't tax it all the way up, right? right. In other countries, it just passes through. Some is, you're going to still pay the tax eventually. Just don't make it pay at that level, right? That's well... Finland also has issues in terms of defining, and, and I'm sorry to say this, a stock option plan. So in the U.S., another C, in, in the U.S., you don't get taxed until you actually realize gain, okay, as a, as a shareholder, or as a, I mean, a, as an employee. In Finland, it depends on your employment contract, it depends on what the value actually is when you get it, and are you getting real value. So it's a little bit more mystical, and that is hard to work with talent and attract good talent um, and makes it, uh, you know, as a doing direct investments in companies, we give a lot of, you know, free, you know, we hire law firms to help them. Um, for GPs, one thing that we'd love to see is not only what Paul was saying, a pass-through, but at least some clarity in the law so that the employees, the founders, can at least make, uh, make that, you know, get, get, get to at least a, a level and also be able to attract more talent and create the hub that you guys want here in this particular country. I know the Netherlands, I work with uh, APB there, you know, huge pension, and they have aggressively changed the tax laws there. And I'm not just focusing on tax on the LP level, I'm talking about the employee level, mm. which is the founder level, to create your hub. But the dream scenario is besides taxes, um, is the opportunity to have that vertical community Talent for engineering, talent for whether it's quantum, capturing a neutral atom with blowing photons at it, but talent that's unique. And I think that if you look at the top com companies in Finland, it looks like Arnaisi. It's like dinosaurs. I'm sorry, an elevator company is one of your top companies? I mean, really? I mean, sorry. It's, company, but yes, it's, <laughs> it's amazing, but yeah. so, it, it's, uh, so I think that there's a lot of talent here, but... Um, create a uniqueness of that talent through your incredibly bright, you know, universities. And that is really some, would be the dream scenario for this country. Can you pass? I think it's a little bit of a vicious circle because, like you said, there are so many universities and the education system is top of the world. But um, the system is not so extrovert. So companies do want to hire talent, but there's so much shortage of talent in Finland right now. And the country, as far as I know, is really trying to import people and help them integrate at least the first step. But it's, it's like this vicious circle. And now the governments are trying to really help in that. So it's not for the lack of talent, like you said, the lack of mechanisms. Yeah. And this is something that uh, should so Kone is. <laughs> Traditional, because there are traditional systems to support it, uh, tax-wise and otherwise, but for Series B and up, it's a bit difficult. Yeah, you're raising something else really cool, which is cultural, and Paul, you know the, the different dynamics of all the cultures that you invest in. And I think that it behooves the Nordic countries in Europe to have more 
American or, or, or the type of LP that are risk takers because the perspective of traditional LPs in Europe are much more conservative. You want to see, show me the money before, very similar to Asia in many ways, show me the money and I'll give you money. It's kind of, kind of like borrowing money from a bank, whereas we invest on a dream. You got a cool dream? Yeah, let's do it, dude. Let's rah, right? <laughs> We just love it. Let's all go and then party. So it's a whole, it, it, it's nice to have that mix of perspectives. That's all. The questions you get from European LPs are quite different than the questions you get from American LPs. It's just like, Given yeah, they're kicking around. They're, they're obsessing about certain things. You're like, <laughs> fucking irrelevant. I know. Like, get over it, dude. This, right? So, yeah. So it's just different styles. But yeah. I mean, but I think films been doing a good job. I mean, obviously, countries have been marketing stuff really well. People know where Friendly is versus 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the nation continues to rise. I mean, you guys bet way above your belt here. Five million people have done pretty well. Yeah. Uh, could do even better, but done really great. So I'm a huge fan, as you guys know. Uh, but yeah, there's always things to improve. And also, it's cool about Finland. People listen. Maybe some feedback we're giving today will be improved upon. That's what's really cool about this society as a culture. So um, yeah, good and bad. But uh, I'll be continuing investing here for the rest of my mm. life. So yeah. I think we have like one or two minutes. Anybody have any question? Now's the chance to do it. Adeo, go for it, go for it. Great panel. Catherine, you were talking about back office uh, and how important that is when you invest to make sure it's not, you have the transparency, et cetera. So They're not using Excel, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> could, could you elaborate on, on what, what you look for when you're evaluating a GP or what you think is a good back office or anything you want to add to that? For single managers and for emerging managers, we like them outsourced because it's cost efficient. And usually a platform that's well recognized and we're comfortable with, that always helps. It's just like, you know, a lot of people like Delaware to incorporate because they're familiar with uh, the laws there. So a back office outsource for, you know, mature managers, you know, they, they've got their own thing and, and there's a lot of compliance and different compliance risk. And that, let me add to another, we like to see our emerging managers with a third-party auditor in there. We like to see a third party, not just, you know, flip this cowboy cat over this way, and now I'm the risk manager, flip it back, and now I'm the, you know. So you don't want a, a Sam Bankman type of situation where the left hand's writing checks for the right hand and back and forth. We want to see audit. Um, we don't want to be on the phone every month asking dumb questions because that you think are dumb that we need for our own risk. Then the second thing is besides a risk manager, third party, and all these can be outsourced, including HR. Everything can be outsourced, and we like to see that efficiency. We don't want to see our manager sitting there doing crap work, back office work, instead of out there hunting. We want you out there hunting, doing deals, scrubbing deals, doing the LDD and FDD. So that, that is something we, we, we would, and we actually want, like to interview and speak to your back office team. Mm. Is there any like professional or like a, a big established back office as a service existing out there which you like or could recommend or They haven't paid or me the market be for built. them. <laughs> <laughs> or what's, is there something there lacking are. in that? There, there are, are multiple, yeah. some are up and coming and yeah, I mean like, um, yeah for me I agree 100% there are, all my funds besides one, outsource that stuff as much as we can. We mm -hmm. want to stay nimble. We like hunting. I don't like doing that shit. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think most of us like doing that, let's be honest, right? Yeah. So, and yeah, I'm happy to hear from your perspective you guys are happy with that too. Because some, yeah, want to have more of that personal connection. But no, it's like, it's a trusted outside party mm -hmm. and it's done and it's efficient. Right. It might cost a little bit more than if you hired somebody full-time, but... It's also, you have that kind of warm feeling outside. It's like, hey, yeah. somebody outside It's actually overlooking. not that much. It's I not mean, that much. No, it's like a grand a month. Um, on average, and there's so many, and I think we were looking at an AI um, new group that's doing the back uh, uh, bookkeeping even for um, entrepreneurs. And we want to take away all your headache. And this goes to compensation real quick, and I know we're running out of time. People ask us, how do we compete with um, BlackRock and you know, Goldman in terms of recruiting top-notch professionals? We, we you know, said this, and I think I met you at the AVCJ in Singapore almost eight years ago, and I came out eight years ago and I said this. The way we compensate our professionals, we take the overhead away from them. We give them a mortgage allowance as they rise in seniority. We also loan them interest-free, loan them so that they co-in 
invest with us. So there's skin in the game. And we saw our performance ratchet up. Because before, they were just writing checks. You know. Here, they've got skin in the game. And, they, and so what that means from our perspective in terms of talent, in terms of back office, is that now they have an incentive to work with um, the GPs in a whole different way. That takes the pressure off of me and our IC. So we also, for our IC, real quick, is that we, we need an internal sponsor. You come to us, we have to follow you, you've got to buddy up with one of our guys, and one of our guys has got a sponsor and says, we love you, we want you. And then you say, okay, that's skin in the game for you, right? Okay, I think that's a wrap. We run out of time. I think we thank you so much. Everybody.